Hi, I'm Lynn Coffin, and uh, this is the latest in a series that I call Notable Nonagenarians. Uh, and uh, today I'm interviewing Rudy Massman, and I'm going to start with a quick uh, biographical sketch, and then we'll get into some of the stories of many stories of Rudy's life. Rudy was born in November 1921. He went to Los Angeles Public Schools and graduated from UCLA in 1943 with a BA. He went into the Navy on active duty from 1943 and 1946 uh, on the USS Kendrick. When the war ended, he volunteered for prize crew duty but ended in China. Tsing Tsao, I think is. Qingdao. Qingdao. In 1946, he was at the University of California uh, studying civil engineering. He graduated but then was recalled to the war in Korea. He uh, did Korea service, uh, which me meant interrupting or trying to interrupt the Chinese supply trains along the east coast of Korea. He was married in 1951, released from active duty in 1953, but remained in the reserve as retired or inactive until 1968. That's 26 years. 1953, he began a civil engineering career. He represented an engineering firm building a school on the Indian Reservation near Yuma. Then in 1954 to 58, he was at the city of San Diego in three departments and became registered as a civil engineer. From 1958 to 1962, he was the first city engineer of Ilpatal in Santa Clara County, California. In 1961, he retired but still continued some high positions. One, the highest, was the County Director of Public Works, which did a major problem solving and maintaining and planning of local government roads, airports, landfills, and so forth. So, a lot of careers and things to talk about with Rudy. And Rudy, what I think I'd like to start with is the story you just told me about what happened at UCLA. The 1942, then, was the first year in the history of UCLA that had ever defeated USC in football. My high school had defeated UCLA before that. After that game, four of us who were in the rally committee, the people who made up the card stunts, took off our UCLA garb and headed across the field to the USC side where we went up and we stole their banner. We folded it up and lugged it out of the stadium. I carried it in my car to the home of a friend and she allowed us, his mother allowed us to hide it behind her Davenport. Uh, after that I was, went into the Navy but I understood that the student body presidents came to an agreement. The USC students had come over and stolen our bell. They agreed to give back the banner they'd give back the bell, and it became an exchange item ever since. Okay, so it ended happily. Okay, It great. ended happily. So when you say that after that, you went into the Navy. I did. So uh, where, where was your first assignment? And okay, my first assignment was to a destroyer, the USS Kendrick. Uh, it had been torpedoed, and when I joined it, the rear end of it had been blown off. Mm -hmm. But I got on there, and I was one of four ensigns who were the first people who were not the original crew I see. to join it. Okay. Now, now you, you told me that uh, you, at one point, you experienced, you had a famous uh, crewmate. Is, is that correct? Well, not a famous crewmate there. I said, when oh, I started at UCLA, uh, one of my famous classmates <laughs> was named Jackie Robinson, who was quite a famous athlete. I never achieved that fame. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, who, so what was the story when you were on the ship? Was that the Kendrick when there was a problem with some of the service you mentioned? Yes, yes, yes. Remember, UCLA was a school that had black students, and I had fellow officers who apparently were not quite adjusted to, to black people. So at dinner one night, one of the people chewed out one of the steward's mates, and I said at dinner, you're prejudiced. And they looked at me and said, well, if you think you can do better, you're going to be in charge of them. So, okay. So I was in charge of the steward's mates, and that left me with the discipline problem. Well, at that time, the man who was in charge of them, their chief, decided he wanted to take them on strike. Well, you don't go on strike in the Navy. But I had to explain to them, he was in the war, he didn't want to be. I was in the war, I didn't want to be. We better get on together. 
And so we got over that incident and kept going. Right. And did you manage the? Then you manage the servers from then on. Were you in charge? Really? I was in charge, and that included buying the special treats for meals. Yes. Oh, okay. Great. Oh, okay. So then you mentioned here uh, that's a very handy a little little uh, outline of various stories. Tell me about the submarine attack. Oh, the submarine attack. Well. When you first start in the Navy and you're not experienced, you have to go through the act of becoming qualified as an officer of the deck, meaning you're in charge of a vessel. Now think about this. You're 22 years old. You're in charge of a destroyer in the Atlantic. You're crossing. You're in charge. All the other officers are asleep, more or less. And we picked up a submarine contact. So I started on a submarine attack. I sent a call to the call, wake up the captain. Captain, should we go to general quarters? He says, no, the noise would scare away the submarine. Just make the attack. What does that mean of going to general quarters? General quarters means you bring everybody up to their guns, ready to oh, engage in action. Oh, I see. So, so he said, just go ahead and fire the guns. No, just go ahead and drop the depth charges. Oh, okay. But visual, so everybody's asleep. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. We make the attack. We drop the depth charges. And that sounds like two freight trains crashing together. Boom! Boom! Yeah. We wake up everybody. Uh, I don't know whether we got the submarine or not because we were ordered back in our position in the convoy. But after that we found that the ship's doctor was in the lifeboat with his, <laughs> with his own and somebody else's life jacket. And after that I found out that he never would go to bed at night. Well, I didn't see him again until after the war. When I met him by accident in Cambridge, he asked me, are you all right? And I said, yeah, I'm all right. And he said, well, I never was again. Really? He says, once that submarine thing got me, I would never go to sleep. And that's why I found out he always wanted to play cards at night. Oh, okay, so you survived the submarine attack and talked to the doctor. Let me ask you, when you look back, you were 23, you said? At 22. That? From, yeah, I went into the Navy at 22. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, do you think you've, the doctor said now he was afraid ever since that attack, do you think you have changed in your personality or your view of things since you were back there in the Navy? I think the Navy was one of the most developmental things that ever happened to me. I found out I was in charge of an expensive vessel with a crew with lives that saved. I was trusted. I found the Navy to be a great ex help for me at that time of my life. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Now, did you know your wife when you went into the Navy, the woman? No, no, I didn't meet her until Berkeley later. Okay, can you tell me about how you met her? I met her mother at the incinerator. <laughs> uh, there was a mutual inc I lived in a garage that had been converted into a house. The rent was low. She lived in the house next door. Uh, I met her mother at the incinerator where we were both burning trash. Later, when her daughter came home from nursing school, she in introduced us. We were married three years later. Wow. Did you know right away? Did you, was there a connection immediately? Lynn, I think she managed it. <laughs> uh, I think the way that worked was, at, at the University of California, uh, the woman who was to be my future wife knew the people involved in the athletic department there uh, through her father, who was a doctor. and. Uh, so I moved away from there when I graduated to go to work in Los Angeles, and she called up and said, I've got two tickets to the Rose Bowl game, which she got through them. Would you like to go to the Rose Bowl game? And I, oh, sure, I'd like to go to the Rose Bowl game. So she flew down to Los Angeles and met me, and we went to the game, and she wore my Letterman sweater, and she went away with it. Oh, Oh. That was kind of like a pre-engagement engagement. engagement. <laughs> it, was, it was sort of something like that. Right. And the mother of a friend of mine who liked her greatly, she arranged to have her home, which was right under the Hollywoodland sign, as the place that, we're, that our wedding took place. Wow. So and was that your first date, though? Your first date was at the Rose Bowl? No, probably right after the incinerator. Okay. The the Rose Bowl came later. Okay, so you had a series of dates, then the Rose Bowl. And yeah, then, and yeah. then we got married. Yeah. yeah. And um, so going back to the Navy, you said that uh, you worked in the Navy uh, for how many years? 
Uh, well, the 26 was a combination of uh, active duty and reserve afterwards. Okay. I retired from the Navy. Okay, and, and when you retired from the Navy, was the uh, working on the Indian Reservation, was that the first? Thing? The first job in 1953 was my first engineering job, okay. and I was already uh, 32. Okay, and you say it's Ketchin? Ketchin? Uh, uh, Kechan tribe. Kechan tribe. And what did you do on the reservation? Well, we built them a five-building school and had a considerable problem because the concrete was setting, setting up very fast, and I didn't know what to do about it, but look, fortunately, uh, there was a United States test station for testing materials in hot weather about 30 miles away. And we went there and found out that the average ground temperature while we were pouring concrete was 130 degrees. Wow. And so that happens to be the kind of material that doesn't do too well when it drives quickly. And I was worried about how we could finish the contract, but we did by adding ice to the water wow. uh, in, in order to keep going. But then I worried about whether the building held up, so I looked it up. And 70 years later, the school's still there. Oh, that's great. That's yeah, really great. Yes, yes, yes. So you mentioned that's the, you, under, you said, 130 degree heat was that, that was the temperature of the concrete without the, the, ground, the temperature. ground temperature. Yeah, right. The ground temperature, right. Okay. And that's not the kind of temperature to pour right. concrete in, and that's not the kind of temperature to know how to handle right. when this is your first job and you don't know about that. Right. That, well, that was amazing that you did such a good job. <laughs> and then while you were there, how long were you there? One year. One year. And you mentioned uh, seeing it or observing or taking part in an Indian funeral? I became friends, yes, yes, Lynn. I became friends with an Indian whose uncle died, and he invited me to go to his uncle's funeral. And he explained to me that in that tribe it was the custom to burn a man's possessions when he died. And he told me before Yuma became a state they burned his wife too. Whoa. But in any event, we went to the funeral, and this man who I met was in the Drum and Bugle Corps, and his uncle was in the Drum and Bugle Corps, and they were burning his set of drums. And he looked on and he said, oh, I would like those drums. Oh, I would like those drums. He said, they cost $500, $500. He says, but I can't have them. They were burned. Wow, wow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I'm just curious now, I'm thinking, um, I mentioned Indian funeral, that's written down here, and then we talked about it, but I guess the politically correct way would be to say Native American, correct? Yes, he was an, it was an Aboriginal tribe, Native Americans, and you can correct me all you want to, Lynn. <laughs> no, I did the same, made the same mistake, huh? um, but just correcting it. So then uh, you moved on to the city of San Diego? I moved to the city of San Diego, and uh, I showed up there. I, I was had to look for another job. I didn't know that, that cities hired engineers. So I went into the uh, personnel department. I said, do you hire engineers here? And they said, yes. What class are you? I said, what's that? They said, oh, you don't know that. Well, all right, how much do you get paid? And I said, I get $500 a month. Oh, you're an associate. So I went to work for the city of San Diego as an associate, and I worked in three departments. I worked in the public works department and streets, I went in the engineering department, and then I ended up, I left from there, having finally worked in the water department. Yeah. And, and during that time, in 56, I passed my engineering registration exam. That's extremely important in an engineer's career, because that enables you to be independent, uh -huh. get going. Okay, so, but you work in three departments in San Diego. Yes. What were the three again? The water was one. Well, the, the public works, engineering, and water. Okay. Yeah. And what of those three, what was your preferred, what, where were you happiest? The one that gave me the most interesting job, Lynn, was one involved a lake where the city had bought a lake that had been built by the Santa Fe Air, uh, Railway in order to set up their uh, subdivision called Rancho Santa Fe. You've probably heard of it. The Santa Fe Railroad uh, bought a Spanish land grant, started a community, built a dam, and had water 
delivered to Rancho Santa Fe. And Santa Fe and San Diego had taken it over in 1925. They bought it. So when I got involved, it went like this. I was working for the city engineer department, and the city treasurer, who I didn't know, called me and said, I want you to interview with the director of the water department. He's got a head of his uh, collection department and his distribution department, but he wants one engineer to work just for him to do whatever he wants. So he said, go up and interview. I went up to be interviewed, and the man described the job, and he said, well, are you interested? And I said, no, thank you. And I left. And I went back to my desk, and a couple days later, the city treasurer called me again, and he said, why didn't you take the job? And I said, well, I visualized a man with armed garters and a green eye shade working away at a desk. That's not me. Okay. He says, you didn't understand. Go back. So I went back to see the director of the water department, and he said, why did you come back? And I said, well, they told me I was wrong. And he says, okay, I'll take you. Come on back. All right, so I went to work there. And he gave me this assignment. He says, we're losing water on the contract to deliver water to Rancho Santa Fe, and I want you to figure out how much it is and what's going on. He didn't well, know why? We ended up, there was not, there, there wasn't any water and they had to buy water right. from Los Angeles. Right. Yeah, yeah. So they had to buy water at a high price and deliver it at a 1925 price. And he made me do it over and over and over again, 32 times. And I finally handed it to him. I said, don't make me do it again. We're losing $500,000 a year. That's, this is secret. Nobody in public knows this. We're losing $500,000 a year. Don't make me do it again. Okay, so he says, uh, we're, we're going to have to negotiate this. So he uh, made a contact with Rancho Santa Fe, and they sent an engineer to meet with me to go over my numbers. By the way, he became my lifelong friend until he died last August. And uh, we went over my numbers and we agreed. And the reason we agreed was the water wasn't there. They had to buy at expensive prices. When it was all agreed to, they turned it over to the attorneys who later worked it out and changed the contract to make it right. So had I, I'm not quite clear. Yeah. So the lake had gone down since the beginning? Was it less water? Less water. Uh, Lynn, the whole story of Southern California is that in the early go-go days, they overestimated the water they had. Right. And so they were thinking that they had water that they didn't have. And in the case of this, Rancho Santa Fe had started it. Uh, correction, Rancho Santa Fe Railroad had started it. Right. The city had taken it over, and they were hooked. Right. And they were having to deliver and losing money. Right. Now, 1956, think about 500,000. That's millions today. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. And is it still going? That community is still there? Rancho Santa Fe? Yeah. That's where the rich people live. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. And they're still in a water deficit situation. A terrible one. Yeah. A terrible yeah. one. Yeah, like the rest of the state, I yeah. guess. Yeah. I, 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 I don't, didn't have that as part of it. Basically, the whole water supply system in Southern California was grossly overestimated when the federal government redistributed it in 1925. Huh. And, and the whole Southern California area was uh, working on a water supply that didn't exist. I see. Yeah, that wouldn't be the first time, would it? No, it wouldn't, but it, it was serious business. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, well, so it, you, you did that. How long did you work as this man's assistant oh, I, or oh, an engineer? I worked for him for a couple of years, and he put me, he put me as assistant head of this water distribution division, where I worked uh, for uh, the last part of my job. But during that job, I got an inquiry... Oh, I had, I was registered now, and I got one of those flyers that came from a city in Santa Clara County looking for a city engineer. I went out to get interviewed, and my wife and family went with me, and I accepted it. And I went back and talked to my boss, and he said, why did you quit? You never complained. <laughs> and I said, I don't complain. Right. I said, I wanted a promotion. Right. <laughs> and so, so I left. Was this uh, Il Pital? Uh, Milpitas is the pronunciation. Milpitas. Mil yeah, so-called thousand cornfields. 
Okay. Okay. And yeah. what did you do for them? Well, I became the first city engineer, and now I had a real lesson. So here I was, my first job. We started, uh, we were there for New Year's Eve. I went to two city councils meetings, and the second meeting, there was a correction. Just before the second meeting, there was a huge rainfall, and the entire town was practically flooded, but there was a subdivision with 220 houses that every basement underneath the floor had flooded. And I showed up at the city council meeting, my second city council meeting, and here were fathers and mothers and children, angrier than could be, buzzing the city council. Why had they allowed this subdivision to be built so that it flooded? Well, we took care of the flooding because I had the assignment to pump them all out. And we took care of that. But after that night, one of the city councilmen came up to me and said, Rudy, tonight, if you had been the engineer who designed that subdivision, you would have been fired. I said, okay, but when I come up with new rules, you back me. Right. Yes. So, and do you think that he was correct? Somebody had miscalculated and took, or was it just beyond the natural, I mean, you can't... Uh... No, it was not beyond the natural at all then. Let me explain this. This is, this is, this <laughs> pre-civil engineering. Right. If the inside of the uh, ground on the inside is higher than the outside, it will flood. And they had built them so the inside was lower. And when the water came across the outside, it flowed in under the house. So they had built them incorrectly. They had built them. The... They had built them according to their non-existent standards. Yeah, yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. Hopefully that wouldn't happen today, right? It didn't happen ever again there because one of the first things I gave them was a set of standards to adopt as a city council and they did and that particular thing was immediately remedied by the requirement of how they built it. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Well it's good to know we're making progress in those things. Oh, right? we were making progress. <laughs> well, okay. We were making progress. So um, one of the things I was curious about just snagged me here. You, going back to the Navy, you mentioned hearing loss Anzio. Can you explain that? title. What does that mean? Yeah, that means that I didn't have my earphones on when a gun went off from about as close to me as that water supply is. Right. And I, for two weeks, lost my hearing. I heard nothing for two weeks. The doctor was worried that I would lose my hearing and be deaf the rest of my life, but it came back. But the hearing in my left ear has been bad ever since I was in my 20s. Uh -huh. Um, Anzio, isn't that the name? Oh, Anzio, Anzio, war story. Uh, the United States was engaged in war across Africa and up Italy, not to defeat Germany, but to keep German troops from being free to attack Russia. So what was going on was an, uh, an attack into Anzio, which is just west of Rome, to possibly attack in and defeat that Russian army, uh, that German army, uh, and we were the land, the, the uh, gunfire support uh, ship, one of the gunfire support ships for that landing. Okay. Yeah. Right. And so you were remained in the ship that was, we were talking hours, or how, how, how does that work with, an, with Anzio? How did that work, that landing? How long did that take? The, well, the troops went out, our part of it uh, was uh, two or three days, but after that, the, the troops that were landed continued to fight, and their, the army general didn't attack fast enough. He could have gone much more quickly, but he, he hesitated, he hesitated, he hesitated, and that fight took a long time. Right. Yeah, and one of my, one of my college friends jumped there and was killed in that landing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so at the end, did, did you take anybody off? The, from the, did the ship take people away? If, or was providing cover? Essentially providing gunfire support at the landing, right. providing cover. Right. And w during that time, we picked up one British pilot whose plane was shot down, brought him on board, laundered his clothes, put him back in a boat dry. Oh, uh, that's good. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it was one of those things. Okay. So, did you have any, um, this is uh, out of the blue, I've heard of some people that have these lives in the service that are exciting and 
meaningful. You're at Anzio, and you have a submarine attack. No, uh, no, no heroics in my life. No, no heroics. No, wait, wait a minute. Uh, that's not the question I was going to ask. <laughs> I was going to ask you if you had any trouble adjusting to civilian life after the drama of being in these exciting war situations. I, when the war ended, I had uh, mixed feelings. I, uh, you know, that was a period. Uh, if you're going to go to to that a little bit later yet, but if you're going to go to when the total war ended, uh, and uh, how did I feel right away? A little confused, a little mixed up, not sure what I was going to do. There were millions of us who had no job. Right. I, what my college career hadn't prepared me for work. I, I hadn't been that smart, <laughs> and and so I went back to UCLA for the summer. Took a course in music. <laughs> okay, this would be what year? Uh, that was '46. Okay. Yeah. Took a course in music. Were you thinking of becoming a musician? No. No, it was a course in, in reading music notation, and the instructor wanted me to read for my final, sing. And I said, I can't do that. I can read you the notes. I'll tell you what the notes say. No, no, she said, you've got to sing. <laughs> well, I'm just curious because, you know, it's a surprise if you come back from the war yeah. and you don't know where your career is going, and then you take music... <laughs> uh, no, I already knew oh, that, that I was going to go to Berkeley. Oh, okay. I knew that I was I was filling in the summertime. I oh, I delivered telephone books that time. I worked as a laborer uh, for a contract. I delivered a telephone book to Betty Davis. Whoa! <laughs> yeah, I did. How did you know? Did it have her name? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I I took all kinds of odd jobs that summer. Right. And what if, so that reminds me, Betty Davis reminds me of Jackie Robinson. Yeah, those did are you, famous. Did you know him? Did you meet him? No, no, he was fam He was famous athlete. Right, okay, <laughs> okay. So you went to Berkeley knowing that you would have a career in civil engineering? Actually, <laughs> and I thought I would, I thought I would uh, make a career that was going to straddle architecture and engineering, but they didn't have such a course. So for two years, I took all the courses in both majors. Well, in architecture, they want you to be able to draw and essentially show your customer what the building you're going to design for them looks like. Well, my drawing skills were abysmal. And you had to, for example, pass it, uh, get six drawings accepted and hung on the wall as proven that you could pass the watercolor class. Well, that wasted all my semester trying to get six drawings uh, on the wall. And I finally got the sixth one hung up there, so I got my C. But I want you to know what the instructor said to me. He says, I like art. He says, I like teaching. He says, but when I look at what you do, he says, I get economic heart failure. <laughs> In any event, I dropped architecture and I finished in engineering. Yeah, how did you understand that economic heart failure? It means he was so dismayed by what you were producing, or uh, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. So you went to Berkeley. How long were you at Berkeley studying to get your four years? Four years, and that would be the years of forty-six through fifty. It's amazing. I can't remember how the last three years. When I was, and you remember all these things. Have you always been able to do that? Remember exactly what, what time it was when you did this and where you were? I'm starting to lose my memory, Lynn, but uh, the thing that the memory that I'm losing more than any other is I'll recognize a person, but I'll forget the name. Right. And uh, that seems to be the thing I'm forgetting more. And then I've got a general picture in my mind now. But I don't remember all the details. Well, I, it's funny you should say that because I happen to know my, my research in memory loss, the first thing to go is what's called anomia, which is what you're saying, anomia, without nouns. And names are the most difficult things. And the reason is, at least most people hypothesize, is that names are not really necessary for survival. It might be necessary to remember that this guy stabbed you in the back the last time where he shook your hand and gave <laughs> yeah. you money. But it's not necessary to remember what his name is. So. No. Well, that, that's, you know, that's 
part of my, right. that's where I am. Just call everybody buddy or friend or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. what about recently? How, where were you living before you moved to the university house? Do you want that story? Sure. It's a sad one. Oh, sorry. But okay, you want to tell all right. Me? My wife, and we were married for 70 years, uh, we went into care for dementia Christmas Eve of 2019. She was in a place where she was locked in and I was locked out and I didn't see her for some seven months. Uh, at the same time, a new place, something similar to this one, opened up. And the lady who was in Ike's position essentially said to me, if you move your wife here and you move here in a separate facility, you can visit your wife every day. So in October last year, I moved her to this other facility and I moved into a assembly alongside. And I was able to visit her every day until Christmas Eve again, 2020. And as I went out of her building, I got told, you can't come back, we've got the COVID in here. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't able to see her again until January 13th, when about six o'clock in the evening, I got a phone call saying, do you want to visit your wife? And I said, why are you calling me now? Is she dying? And they said, yes. And I went over and she was dead. Oh. And I absorbed that there, but I didn't want to stay there. And uh, I had lost my respect for the organization, for their system. And I, I just couldn't stay there and be happy continuing. In the meantime, since I hadn't sold my home and my son put his daughter in there, I had blocked myself from going back to my own house. So I couldn't go to my own house and I didn't want to stay there. And my daughter, uh, who lives here and who's a University of Washington prof, said, come up here, be with the family. And so we worked it out with Ike and he moved me in. That's great. You moved in when? In the middle of April. Mm -hmm. I've been here three months, a little over. Right. Well, you seem like a, you know, you adapted very quickly. Well, making friends, uh, going to dinner, and doing activities. Well, aside from being unhappy when I'm unhappy, I'm happy most of the time. <laughs> so <laughs> tell me, you have mentioned a son and a daughter. You have. I have a son and a daughter. My son lives near Yosemite Park. My daughter lives uh, in uh, Villa. Am I going to stump you when I say Villa? Yeah, I mean, I've heard the name, but I don't know where it is. Well, it's the name, the original name for a, a county area outside of the city of Seattle that's essentially north of Magnuson Park. Oh, yes. Okay. On the waterfront. Okay. I've seen that there. Have you visited her? Did you Have you gone to her house there? And uh -oh. Yeah, uh, they'll be here for dinner tonight. Uh, we can't eat in there, so they're coming into my room. And they're going to eat. They're going to bring dinner. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah. That's great. Has there been anything that, I mean, I appreciate your sharing a story that it is a very sad story about your wife, and I'm very sorry that that happened. Yeah. It must have been very hard. Um, I'm wondering, you know, on a lower, uh, yeah, a level lower of tone. importance, you know, yeah. what, uh, what, what you've, have you found it easy to... Uh, I mean, again, you seem, you know, you're very voluble, you're cheerful, you're personal. Okay, I've been looking for something where I'm not just a spectator, Lynn. Mm -hmm. So I went into Vell's creative writing class. Right, I heard about that. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, Vell's class has, is the one activity where I've done that. Uh, Alice knows that I've tried a couple of things where they, they're running a program. And... I'm hoping, I'm not sure where what I, I can do, but I'm hoping I can somehow or other end up active in something here other than as a spectator. Now, I went to the uh, lecture on grain the other morning. On grain? Yeah, oh, that's, that's uh, yeah, the man is a son of one of the residents here. Okay. Uh, and, I, and I like that. I've gone, I, I went to a grocery store with Alice for the first time in a year and a half. That yeah. was exciting, right? Oh, I tell you, yesterday. Right. Do you and do any I, cooking for yourself? I'm doing my own breakfast, and I'm eating 
dinner right. here. Yeah. Right. Well, I, I, I think you're a natural storyteller, obviously, and you have a lot of good stories to tell. And from what I hear from the writing class, you're also a natural writer. I don't so know about that, lady. I don't know about that. I would encourage that. you to write your autobiography. It gets started as soon as possible, and you have the already outline. The outline also. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I yeah. don't know. Anyway, is there anything that you would like to say to the, the other residents or to the public at large? Um, you're, you're about to be, uh, I think, in November, a centenarian, right? <laughs> right. But I, I think uh, you will join the three or four people here that are over a hundred, and I wonder if you have some... Yes, I do, I do, I do. Uh, I'll, I'll say this. If people ask you, what did you do, which is a typical question when you sit down at a table with a stranger, and uh, I'll say I was a civil engineer, this might be the answer I get. Oh, I know what a civil engineer is. Ho hum. <laughs> And this civil engineer wants people to know that what I did had a bunch of stories connected to right. it. Right. Yes. Right. And you, and you, people, when they say they know what a civil engineer does, if I remember from our dinner, one dinner conversation, they're not correct. They don't have the right idea what a civil engineer No, is. no, no, no. Can I tell you one more story? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. That's a good place to end. All right. One more story. One more story. All right. When I got to the point where you didn't question me, but where I was involved in transportation, one of the assignments we got was to put a bus terminal into San Diego State University. And the location that uh, we were given was controlled by the university architect and by the university president. And they said, we want it right in this particular place, coming right into the school library. Well, in order to do what they wanted, we had to take a building that was used by one of those village uh, centers for people of the Presbyterian religion. But it was one of the buildings in a series owned by the alumni of the university. And they said, okay, that's no problem. If you take that building, we'll move them over three houses. So I knew there was no problem. And we get to a Board of Supervisors meeting, and the representative of that particular denomination shows up, and he makes a uh, long diatribal speech about taking this home away from home, uh, away from these students, when all we were going to do is move them three houses. And he gets all done talking, and one of the supervisors starts on me, and he says, you, he says, you've done bad things in your life. He says, but this is one of the worst things you've ever done. He says, taking this home away from these people, and I'm getting madder and madder. Because I, I wasn't about to want to take that. And the minister, who had now gone back to his seat in the middle of the auditorium, stood up and he said to the supervisor, Sir, he says, if you ever give up politics and you want another career, I suggest that you become a minister. <laughs> well, I broke out laughing. And I, I, I wasn't angry any longer, and I broke up laughing, and I had my revenge all planned. And so after the meeting, I went up to the chairman of the board, and I said, on Monday, when you give away awards, can I give an award to that supervisor? Okay. He didn't ask me what I wanted to do, just said, okay. So I went back to the office, and I got one of my assistants, and I said, I want you to go out and buy a black shirt. And I want you to sew a white collar on it. And I want you to write on the front of it, supervisor's first name was Roger, Roger the Preacher Man. And so they prepared the shirt for me. And a couple of weeks later when we were ready, I went to the board meeting. And when they were having the awards, I asked the chairman, can I give an award? And go ahead. And so I went up and I presented him not only with the shirt, but with one of those uh, shop for a priest certificate. <laughs> and, uh, so let me ask you, this is me as an interviewer, so the one thing I don't understand, at what point did it become clear to the other people that this, we were, you were talking about a three-door move? At the meeting you said they just had to move three doors over, right? Did it go through? Did they oh, we, built the, we, we built right. a facility uh, 
the, the speech making was unnecessary. Right. Nobody was hurt. Right. I mean, uh, moving three doors down didn't mean they lo lost their facility. No, right. Uh, and did that become clear at that original meeting? Or not until later? Not spoken at the meeting. Okay. Not spoken at the meeting. Okay. This was this was all verbal play. I see. Okay. It was all verbal play. Well, and speaking I, of verbal play, you do it excellently, and I'm really glad that you agreed to come and be interviewed. Okay. I wish you all the best success here. I really, if you need some writing coaching on writing your memoirs, please come <laughs> here. I'm happy to do it. I know Val would be too. So thank you very much, Rudy. I Thank appreciate you. It. Thanks a lot. Okay.